Okay, we are live and uh, episode 29 of Before the Trainwreck, Why She's a Control Freak. And um, I was told before that Hangouts on Air is going away on August 1st for quick streaming. And I just got the announcement bubble there. So there it is. Oh, hang on. Getting some feedback there and some audio. Let's clean that up. I just got the announcement bubble. There we go. Turn that off. <laughs> We're doing this in a different way tonight, Sean. How you doing? I'm doing good. I got questions for you about this new Corvette that's okay. coming out in 2020. Yeah, let's talk 2020 Corvette before we kick into why she's a control freak. Let's talk about cars. All right. Go. I like cars. Cars right. are good. I like cars. <laughs> cars are good. It's like, I like girls. Yeah. Girls are nice. They smell pretty. Yeah. So yeah. my, my thought on these, this Corvette, I want to hear your thoughts on it, but I love cars. I'm not enough of a car guy that I would go out and invest in an exotic like you, but you know, something like the 2020 Corvette, it's a little better price point and it's got some good numbers. What are your thoughts on it? Well, it's funny that you talk about investing in cars and buying cars because I'm doing a broadcast tomorrow on Aaron Cleary's older brother channel at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I think he wants to dive into getting into these sorts of toys, which is interesting because he's not a car guy at all whatsoever. But um, check out his channel for that. We'll be on at 4 p.m. So the new Corvette that's coming out in 2020 is the first mid-engine Corvette, uh, which is brand spanking new since these cars came out. I think it was 1954 or 55, if I'm remembering history correctly, that the first yes. Corvette came out. Always um, been a front-engine car. Yeah, and it's always been a front engine, rear drive car, um, and they've done everything they can over the years to make it work and run better, but they've decided with this generation uh, to stick the engine in the middle, which gives you a far better weight balance. Uh, it's better for accelerations, better for handling. Um, it just improves the overall dynamics of the car. So it's supposed to be pretty crazy. I saw it on the Jay Leno's Garage Vessel, and um, they're claiming the base model is supposed to go zero to 60, 2.9 seconds, which is really fast. That's like McLaren yeah. territory. Yeah. Um, selling it for 59,000 too, apparently, US dollars. Yeah, that, that doesn't add up to me. I don't think they're going to stay 59 for very long. What does your R8 do, zero to 60? I've never timed it, but I would imagine, I mean, it's got some work done to it because it's got a intake and exhaust and software too. And so it's got about 600 horse. Um, um, I'm I'm pretty sure it's sub three seconds. It would um, have to be. Yeah, but I've never, you know, but I've never timed it myself, so I really couldn't tell you for sure. But it's a quick car. I mean, when you're going zero to sixty in less than three seconds, it doesn't matter if it's you know like two point nine or two point five. It's it's blisteringly fat fast. It's like you know, if you're going through the divorce machine and it's, you're having a bad experience, it doesn't matter if you're losing ten million dollars or million dollars. You're still losing a hell of a lot. It's like pretty significant. But the margin is very, you know, small when you get down to those uh, points. But anyway, it's going to be the performance bargain of the century, apparently. But I'm going to wait for the stats on the Z06 or the ZR1 because those will be the real uh, missiles. Yeah, for sure. When do those come out? Uh, they usually release them about a year or two after the first model. Usually about a year is the Z06, and then the ZR1 comes out a few years later. I'm going to estimate the ZR1 will have about 900 horsepower, which will be insane because when I was a kid, I would never have thought for a minute that you'd see a car with 900 horsepower that the average public could buy. No, that's crazy. And even the 490 that this um, that the Stingray comes with, that's pretty yeah. crazy for something that comes off the line. Yeah, it'll it'll be a nice piece of work. So yeah, sure. let's switch gears. Let's talk about uh, before the train wreck stuff. We've got um, the topic, which was kind of inspired by a comment in the last broadcast. And um, if you guys are just kind of joining in, um, we're kind of doing this remote. Um, there will be no show next week because I'll be traveling. But I wanted to get this one out, and uh, there's no call-in component tonight. But what I'll do, actually, I will grab the join link and post it in the chat right now. So if you have a question, you can join in. Uh, but mute yourself, please, when you join in and um, present the question to Sean and I. So similar to the call-in component, uh, join link. Just kind of trying to do this all on a laptop, which is a lot more difficult. Uh, don't click that to watch. That's just to come in and ask uh, questions and participate in the live broadcast. If you want to protect your identity, then join with your camera off. Just run audio. Uh, um, you know, if you're concerned about anything, but um, by all means, show your face. We like talking to people face to face too. Um, but we were inspired last week by somebody that was asking. I think it was in a, a super chat. Somebody said something about how do you handle control freaks. What was the question? Because I think you made a note of it. 
Yeah, we had this question last week. We were talking about high drama and relationships and controlling behavior. And I had made this comment and I, I'm going to take credit for this comment because I've never, this phrase, I've never heard anybody else say this. Maybe somebody else has, but one way that people manage their emotions when they're not managing them correctly is that they will try to manage their own emotions by controlling somebody else's behavior. So rather than dealing with whatever's going on inside of them, they will look outside in the world and try to control what other people do, what other people say. You see this a lot on campuses right now where people get upset feelings and their response to that is to try to shut down speech from other people. Sorry, I just got to mute that audio. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat too. We got a super chat from Mike. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry, Sean, carry on. Yeah, I carry on. That, that's that's the gist of it. That's, that, um, that's and and in a well, I guess I'm, I'll bring it around to the train wreck question that one of the things you see in relationships when people get really controlling is they will try to manage their own emotions, their insecurity, their anxiety about the relationship, whatever it is, by controlling what the other person does. So they're basically controlling the inputs rather than dealing with the dealing with their emotions correctly. And what is the correct way for us to deal with that when you have somebody that tries to control the direction of the relationship with that behavior? Well, obviously it's not acceptable, but there's a lot of ways to get to not letting it happen. So I guess it kind of depends on case by case, but you know, it's like any other aggressive behavior, the earlier you catch it, the easier it is to nip it in the bud. Okay. And if it's if it's been happening for a while, like let's say that somebody's been dealing with this for a while and uh, it's getting exhausting, their batteries are getting drained, they're wondering if they should even bother with this relationship. How how should they be dealing with that? That's tough, man. Because you know, I was talking to a guy recently who has been putting up with it for years with somebody who sounds you know, probably a little personality disordered, and finally he decided to put his foot down on the controlling behavior. And man, he's dealing with this blowback. It's what's called a behavior mm -hmm. or a um, extinction, extinction burst is what it's called. Like if you have a little kid that's having temper tantrums and getting their way by having temper tantrums, mm -hmm. and then one day you decide as the parent that the temper tantrums aren't going to work anymore, and you say no to the temper tantrum, well, what does the kid do? The kid escalates the temper tantrum to try to put things back in balance. And so now it has a mother of all temper tantrums. And that, by the way, is the worst time to give in to the temper tantrum because now you've raised the bar and the kid knows that they have to get it up to this level on their next tantrum to get what they want. So you have to ride out that extinction burst. But that's what's going on in this guy's relationship is he's trying to ride out this extinction burst of this very controlling woman now coming to grips with the fact that the controlling behavior is not going to work for him anymore. Right. And I got a few questions. I want to kind of dive into that a little bit. So um, before I go on it on again, guys, uh, blog talks aren't running tonight. I'm working remotely. So if you have a question for tonight's show on the panel, there's a join link, which I posted in the chat and I'm just checking here on my phone. It looks like, yeah, it's there. Um, it's just posted under the Entrepreneurs and Cars login. Click that, join from a mobile device that has uh, Google Hangouts on it. If you don't have Hangouts downloaded, it's native to Android devices. You might have to download it for an, I for an iPhone or something like that. Um, but you should be able to click it. It should open right away. Just make sure you're muted when you join and have a question ready for us. And we'll dive into whatever it is. Again, the show's before the train wreck. What we're trying to do is help you guys avoid making a potential train wreck out of your life. Uh, Sean and I had this conversation well over a year ago now, and we were certainly talking about trying to get to guys before they make a total mess of things. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting to note that most guys come to the sort of things that we talk about and have written about or even produce video videos on, um, as a function of trauma, but you want to try to avoid this because it, because the costs associated with cleaning up a train wreck are far greater than slowing things down and maybe making a, a course deviation or course correction. Um, so back to the topic of hand, when she's a control freak, um, let's say somebody's dealing with this and they've watched her stuff, they've seen a few of the Before the train wreck series, maybe they've read your book, they've watched a bunch of my videos or the My Community, and they're picking up on this as a red flag. When does a guy decide to this cord's getting tangled up here, damn you. When does a guy decide um, to abandon ship and throw in the towel and say, forget it, the juice is not worth the squeeze versus, okay, this is something that I can work on? Like, how would they figure that part out? I think my, my personal opinion is that that happens after you've given them the benefit of the doubt and they've gone back to the controlling behavior. And in my book, everybody gets the benefit of the doubt because 
it's really easy to point at somebody's behavior and say, I don't like this and this is why they're doing it. And you tell yourself a story about why they're doing it. But if you can ask yourself the question, all right, I'm going to step back from this situation and I'm going to ask myself, why is she being controlling? And that why question is pretty tough because it means that you have to be willing to collect data. You have to be willing to set aside the story in your head about how you're be being mistreated and actually explore it. Maybe there's something in her background that leads her to be controlling. Maybe she's not fully aware of it and she wants to do the work to improve, then cool. But if not, you know, she, she gets the benefit of the doubt one time. Well, I don't know. How many times do you want to go back after that, I guess, is the question. Have you ever been with a control freak? I know you've been married for a while, but have you ever dated one in the past? No, not really. No, because I think I, I picked up on it. I, I had troubled relationships in the past, like everybody, but and I picked poorly a few times. But controlling behavior is something that I tended to weed out very quickly because I don't like being controlled. I'm kind of a rebellious person, and so I just don't click with people who want to control me. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's important that 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 you set those boundaries and um, remove that nonsense from your life. Hey, Conk, I see you're in the chat. Do me a favor, click that youtube link that i put in there if you're on a device where you can just join the hangout i want to make sure it's working properly um and that i got the right link um somebody can just either comment or try to join in just want to make sure it's working because uh we're kind of winging this one tonight with this remote setup um, so kink or conk yeah kink conk had a, a a good comment there too i, I wish he would come on and expand on it he said that there's a difference between controlling behavior and enforcing boundaries, boundaries yeah. and that they can look similar from a distance so, yeah. Rich, what do you think is the answer to you? how many shots does she get at this controlling behavior? Uh, I would uh, now. I would. I would certainly put my foot down very, very quickly. Um, in the past, I've tolerated it uh, to a huge degree, and it doesn't work out well. I mean, um, it's it's one of the things that um, I think contributes to what Carl calls betaization by a thousand concessions. Because usually the controlling behavior forces you as the guy to make multiple concessions one after the other. Um, and it might start out with something simple like, you know, put your dark socks in the dark hamper and your white socks in the white hamper, which is pretty basic. And then it can get into, you know, a lot more, you know, significant things like, no, we're not going to spend $8,000 on the basic crystal chandelier. I want the $22,000 Swarovski crystal one because it has to look like this and blah, blah, blah sort of thing. And that's when you can find yourself being run completely in the relationship in a direction that really doesn't serve you. Conk, just unmute yourself, see if that works. No, you're talking, but you're muted. There you go. Oh, I'm not hearing you. Still not hearing you. <laughs> How's that? There you go. All righty. Hey, man, thanks for joining and trying that out. Did you want to expand on that comment that you made there? Yeah, I just want to, I'm thinking like from the outside looking in, like if a new guy is watching this show and people are talking about don't be controlling, but we also talk about having boundaries and setting boundaries also. And so me just like bird's eye view looking at it, I could see how a new guy learning all of this still, you know, red pill and basic relational dynamics, how those could look alike. Uh, controlling behavior bad, making boundaries good, but especially if you have like, you know, severe nice guy syndrome, those could kind of look like the same thing. So in, in this scenario, who's setting the boundaries? Is she setting the boundaries or is it the guy? Um, either way, because I'm just thinking of it from the nice guy syndrome perspective where like setting boundaries is bad. I believe in being an open and free and being honest about everything, you know, and those are the kind of guys that end up getting controlled, so to speak. So when we talk about setting boundaries, a lot of people I've seen in my experience relate that to you trying to be controlling another people. All right, so if I'm setting a boundary with somebody, they might accuse me of being controlling. Yeah, or that's how yeah. some people would think that when we're telling guys, you know, have frame, you know, control your frame, set boundaries, vet people, things mm -hmm. like that. I could see how people would think that as you being controlling. Yeah. Here, you know, here's the thing about the whole controlling dynamic. You know, women women want to be in the frame of a masculine man, right? Mm -hmm. So if you let them run the show on everything, it's it's just going to turn them off eventually, right? Like they're not going to have any respect for you. I'm sure you've seen this in practice, Sean, um, or even you, Corey. Like if somebody comes yeah. in and they're, you know, they're talking about the relationship and something comes up like, oh, you know, she's really controlling and I don't know what to do sort of thing. And 
you know, by the same token, she's probably not that interested in doing any work to salvage the relationship or even to, um, you know, enter his frame and let him kind of run the relationship, you know, for the betterment of the couple sort of thing. Like, am I offside here? Tell me, you know, take me to task. I think in my practice, I've seen maybe a handful of relationships where it works out pretty well for both people when the guy is pretty well whipped and, and the woman is, you know, just got him under a yoke. Usually she doesn't respect him very much. Let me ask you this. Okay. So if she doesn't respect him, does, and, and you said that this can work out well for both of them. I mean, you've seen it, you know, work out well, but do they have a, can like a productive relationship in the sense where there's like are like is there any intimacy because so far as i can tell if a woman doesn't respect a man and she's trying to run him all day long she's not going to want to bang him right that's yeah, pretty much going to be transactional right when it goes into those right transaction like that's that's where you see those social media posts where there's a picture of a whiteboard and it's like you know you do these 17 things oh, and yeah, you put away the dishes and mop the floor and clean up the uh dog shit from the yard and all that then maybe you'll get a beeger right that's yeah. what it looks like I've, <laughs> I've seen here's where i've seen it work i've seen it work when there is some kind of power exchange formal power exchange relationship like in the king community where people will uh, develop contracts about who's in charge of what and who's running things and they stick to the contract and i've seen that work where the female is dominant i have not seen these couples when they're 70 years old so i don't know what it looks like 30 40 50 years down the road after you know decades of this i don't know if it lasts for decades i don't know if she respects him after decades but that's where i've mostly where i've seen it work mm. yeah dom sub sort of relationship all yeah. right so Again, guys, the join link is working. Uh, Corey just joined in. It's the last comment that I popped in there. Make sure you click it from either an Android device because Hangouts is native, or you have it on an iOS device if you've downloaded the app. Otherwise, just open it from a Chrome browser on any kind of laptop or, or desktop, and it should allow you right into the Hangout. Um, there's no call-in number tonight. That's not running, but you can join the Hangout and ask the questions that way. The call-ins will be back in the future um, after we take a break next week. I did want to say one thing real quick before I head out. Yeah, help. Oh, sorry. see controlling versus boundaries is they do look similar, but controlling usually comes from insecurity and boundaries comes from security, if that makes sense. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So insecurity, and it kind of all goes back to frame and your mindset and like who you feel controls your situation. So when you set boundaries, you're your own frame and you're doing that based off of your needs and wants. And it's you as your own mental point of origin. But when you're controlling, that is more of insecurity where you're still relating all of it on the other person. And it's kind of like what Sean was talking about before, where you're basing all your behavior off of reactions of what they're doing, right? And so you're not your own mental point of origin when you're frame, when you're when you're controlling. You're not your own mental point of origin because all of your rules and decisions are based on other people's, and you're reacting to it. Mm. It's not your own fortitude and your own sense of being that's establishing those boundaries. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Oh, no problem. Are you guys? Uh, having... Thanks, brother. Um, Sean. Where yep. should we where should we go from here? We're um, you know we're lacking call-ins tonight. We might have to just kind of have like a back and forth chat. You, you and yeah, I. Yeah, I was I was should thinking just, you're should we you're just interview each other? <laughs> sure, <laughs> let's do an AMA. <laughs> um, I was thinking when you're talking about betaization by a thousand cuts. <laughs> I worked for a year or so in, in prisons when I was coming out of my clinical training, and I came across this book called Games Criminals Play. You know, it was for law enforcement people. It was a really outdated book. It's like written in the 50s, I think. And it had this all this old outdated terminology, like they would call prison guards screws, which nobody says anymore. It's like that gave you they give you an indication of how old it was. But it talked about how if you weren't careful in prison, that these that the real sociopaths would groom you. And it talked about specifically how they groomed you. Like they would ask for little favors. They asked for a stamp. You know, it would start with something that small. Just give me a stamp. And if they could get you to break some little rule, just absolutely trivial rule, then they would take it up to the next rung. And then it'd have you breaking a slightly smaller rule. And eventually they get you to this point where you're in a corner and they own you. 
And it's, it's just such a, an interesting thing because obviously you know, a relationship is different than a guard uh, inmate relationship, but there is this similarity in the human way of moving through relationships. When you have that sociopathic way of operating, it looks very similar. It's like these ever narrowing circles of attack where it starts out small, like you were talking about, we're not going to get that China. We're going to get this China and we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. And, you know, eventually one partner owns the other partner, like the criminal owns the, the prison guard or the prison psychologist or something. It, yeah. I think a lot of the times guys are preconditioned though, to, to enter her frame yeah. and to, yeah. to, to kind of serve her, needs wants and desires you know the whole happy wife happy life sort of thing mm -hmm. um so they'll end up towing the line and then they'll end up finding themselves in a position where i mean you know there's somebody that here in the chat and i asked him to join us to kind of expand on it but he said my ex was completely controlling but still wanted to bang him every single day and i wonder if that was part of the controlling mechanism or if there's more to it but more often than not these guys find them in a pos find themselves in a position of like they just feel like an ATM. They just feel like they're just there to facilitate whatever dreams and needs and wants are, um, you know, placed on the table. It's like there's a honey to do list every single morning, or there's a yes stamp, and it's like honey yes stamp, honey yes stamp, and they just keep stamping everything yes yes yes. And there's no, mm -hmm. there's no way that you can even have your say or you can have any of your needs and wants met. There was a guy that we talked to last week. I don't know if you remember, but it was towards the end of the show. Um, I think he was 58 or so, and he had moved out of the house, and his wife had changed the locks on the house that he had bought, and she said that she would she would prefer just to date him than to be married to him, yeah. um, and he would get an earful if he would bring something like a new gun home for 600 bucks, um, but she was okay to spend $600 on a new handbag or purse or shoes or, or something like that. Like Like that control mechanism can lead you to a point where you actually get like you leave your own home, your matrimonial home, you've been married to your wife forever, your kids are grown up, and she changes the locks on your own home. Like that's like that's pretty controlling there, right? Yeah, that guy intrigued me. And I thought a lot about him after we got off the horn last time because I was thinking about the way he carried himself in the conversation. I don't mean to rip on that guy because he's not here, but he struck me as more of a talker than a listener, right? Mm -hmm. And And I was thinking about, you know, this, this controlling behavior that didn't fit with some of the other behavior that she's doing. Like she still wanted to be close to him, but she needed to manage the way she did that. And there was a lot more to that story that you and I didn't get to hear. And that's where it comes back to that question I was talking about earlier. Like, okay, she's controlling. Why is she controlling? I was very intrigued by that call. I'd yeah. love to sit down with him for an hour. Let's um, switch over to World War II Kitty Hawk. If you want to unmute yourself, love to hear what you have to add to the conversation or a question you want to ask. No, you're talking, but I can't hear you. You're still muted. Should be somewhere on the bottom Here of the screen. There yeah. you go. Fire away. Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey, man. Yeah, I, I don't really have a question, but I had two ex-girlfriends when I was in my uh, early 20s, and they were both control freaks, and I used to be the typical beta male. I'd you know, pay for everything. Um, if they wanted to go on vacation, I'd pay for all of that, and um, I used to pretty much be like an obedient servant. I thought that's what I had to do, and... Um, yeah, both of them, I was just thinking about what you guys are saying. Both of them, when I was just having a shower, um, both of them done the exact same thing to me. They both dumped me. They both didn't have respect for me, and they both cheated on me with other guys. So I've always found that when you just bow down to what women always say and you don't put your foot down, it's going to cause problems in the end where they end up losing respect for you. Um, yeah, so I can really relate to what you're saying because that's that happened to me twice with two different women. So, and plus, I had I had bad choices as a woman. I predominantly went out with women that were you know super good looking. So, um, I don't know if that's if there's a correlation between women being really insecure and beautiful, or you know. Uh, no, I don't maybe. think so. I think that you'll get it with you know fives and sixes too. I mean, there's yeah. there's attractive women that aren't controlling. It's it's not you know exclusive to you know, very beautiful women to be super controlling. But I mean, the thing is, is that you're constantly tested as a man. Women mm. are subconsciously testing you. They're testing your frame. You know, it's a whole shit testing thing and they want to see your level of competency. And if you, and if you don't maintain frame, it's either she's going to enter your frame in that relationship or you're going to enter hers. And mm. when you enter hers, eventually when, what usually ends up happening was what you experienced yourself twice there, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. You got any further thoughts on that, Sean? Well, I'm curious. You said you chose poorly. What do you think you brought to the equation that uh, maybe they weren't controlling by nature, but maybe they got with you and it brought something out in them? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I'm not too sure because, like, I was quite a good looking, like, obviously, I'm a lot older now, but I was quite a good looking guy myself when I was younger. But you're still a handsome uh, devil, don't sell yourself short. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm nearly 40 now, but yeah, I, I'm not too sure to be honest. I, I used to feel like it was my fault when we when they broke up with me that I'd done something wrong, and then looking back as an older person, I realized I'd done everything for these girls, but I never really said no to them when it came to anything, and um. But one girlfriend in particular, I noticed that her her mum and father, uh, her mother and father were like that as well. Like the father was a very quiet man, and um, this is the girl that I was with for quite a few years. And um, but the mother used to just dominate. He used to just dominate the father, and the father was just like real placid. He'd never say anything to the mother. And um, I, I remember when I stayed with them for for a year, I actually was homeless for a year, and I didn't have anywhere to stay. So I moved in, which is a bad decision. I moved in with my ex girlfriend and her family. And uh, it was quite a nice home, but um, every time we got into an argument, my girlfriend wanted to like argue at the doorway. So I was in the bedroom playing a video game or something. She'd want to stand in the doorway where her parents were in the lounge and, and just argue with me in the doorway. I'd be like, close the door, why are you? But I always felt like she was showing off to her sister because her sister was there and her um, her mother. Not really the father. The father wouldn't really come to my defense or anything like that, but just over petty stuff too because she couldn't get her own way. She wanted to go, you know, go out shopping or wanted to go to the movies. Like she couldn't just relax and just chill around ha- at home. We always had to do something. I always had to pay money. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite. Actually, I'll tell you one little story if you don't mind. Is that okay? It was, it was yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember one time, this is sort of near the end of the relationship. Um, my ex girlfriend, I was actually trying to save money because I was trying to get my own place and I was wanting to move out of that situation. And my ex-girlfriend was like, oh, let's go out and do something. So I'm like, okay. So we went out. We had some, you know, had some uh, dinner. We had some dinner. And I think it cost me $100 or something like that. And she's like, oh, let's go and watch a movie. I was thinking, oh, shit, I was trying to save money, you know. And I didn't have a lot of money at the time. And then so we went to the movies. And the actual movie that I was wanting to watch, um, it was, like, not showing. Like, it was, like, a couple of hours away. I thought to myself, oh, sweet, I, can, I don't have to say, no, we can't see a movie, we can go home. And she goes, oh, no, there's another movie theater around the corner, let's go and, uh, they, they might be showing up. So I was like, oh, okay. So I went around there, and uh, before we'd done that, we brought an ice cream, and we brought these real expensive ice creams, they're like $30, $40. So my money was like draining down, and I think I only had like $50 left. And um, so when we, when we went to the movies, the movie was showing at the other place, um, it was like $55. So I was like short $5. So I, I looked at my ex-girlfriend and she goes, oh, yeah, I want this, I want this. She started ordering all these things up. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Ended up being $55. And I only had $50 left. And then um, what did she say? She goes, okay, that's $55, looking at me to pay for it. And then I looked at it looked at it, and, I, and I, I realized I didn't have enough money. I looked at her and I said, so I might pay for this as well. And then she kicked up this massive thing out in front of all the people that like, embarrassed me, started yelling, and then, she goes, oh, what? You, what? And then she opened up her wallet, and I looked at her wallet, and it was just full of hundreds of dollars, man. She had so much money in her purse, and I felt embarrassed. And even the lady in the checkout was, like, looking at me like, why aren't you paying? Like, even the lady in the checkout thing was, like, wondering why I couldn't pay for it. But it's just, yeah. it was just a real embarrassing. That was one of the one of the reasons why we broke up, because I just had really had enough. I put up with that for, like, two years of her being like that, and... In the end, she didn't really want me to get ahead. She just always wanted to party, always wanted to go out. Um, yeah, just didn't care if she spent all my money. <laughs> but that, was that sounds like she did you a favor. Yeah, she did. Sounds like she did you a big favor. I, I mean, yeah. I want to get over to um, Barrett in a second because I know he joined on uh, too. But um, Sean, what's the correlation between you know the parents and the way that the dynamic of that relationship runs? Like. You're dating a woman and you go over to their place, you know, they got a family event going on or something like that. And then you notice the mom's running the dad. Mm-hmm. Like, um, let me share a quick experience with you. So I was dating this girl in my 20s and I went over to their, to their parents' place. They just got this new place out in um, Peterborough. And um, there was a big ass rock in the backyard and it was Christmas Eve. And we're sitting there and I'm helping them assemble some stand because they just moved in, you know, for the entertainment stuff. And the mom comes along and she goes, 
you know, Walter, I think that that rock over there in the backyard should get moved 20 foot over to the left. And it's freezing cold out. It's Christmas Eve. They just moved in the house. And she's already laying this honey to-do list and trying to browbeat him into running things in the backyard. Like, he literally went out in the backyard and started rolling this big-ass rock around. Like, <laughs> what's, what's, what's... Was his name Sisyphus? <laughs> well, you know, that was that was pretty much the writing on the wall for me. Like I was yeah. aware enough at that point to say, okay, well I see it in the girl that I'm dating and I see where she gets it from now. And there's no way that I'm moving rocks on Christmas Eve when I'm 70 years old, forget it. But what's the correlation, you know, between the dynamic, you know, between the parents and the woman you're dating? Like, is there any correlation? Like what's your view on that? My view on that is I actually talk about this in, in the tactical guide to women, because it's really important to size up the relationships from where she's coming from because people have this tendency to do what they grew up around and people like really complicated explanations for these kind of things. And people in my profession, I know exceptionally all kinds of complicated explanations about reenacting trauma or whatever. People just do what they're taught. Like I organize my garage the way my father organized his garage because that's just what I learned how to do. So unless a person makes a different choice, they're going to tend to do their relationships the way their parents do their relationships. Now, some people make the choice that they're going to swing in the opposite direction and they, they overcorrect in that direction. But yeah, it's really important that you look at where she's coming from because unless she has made some conscious decision, otherwise, that's what she's going to be doing to you. Yeah. I think it's a bad. good assessment. Yeah. I think it's a good assessment. Um, I want to switch over to yeah. you in just one sec, Barrett. There's a super chat here. I just want to adjust real quick. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, thanks, man. Um, Rakatosa Mad says, come from a super controlling mother. I'm still close with her, but have to keep a short-term exposure ever since I left. I keep running into controlling women. Can't stand it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if you saw it in your mom growing up and she's trying to run your life, it's okay to keep you know, family at arm's length if you have to at some point. I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, another real quick super chat here uh, from Mikas Audio. He says, try try to move controlling thing in a family court as a man. <laughs> yeah, you definitely don't want to get divorced from a controlling woman. Try, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you will be surprised that nobody listens to you. If she were ever to say uh, you were a control freak, they will tie it up into a knot. Um, yeah, you definitely want to vet for controlling women before you marry them because yeah. if you think it's hard, living with them or being in a relationship with them i can assure you it's considerably harder getting divorced from them barrett you can unmute yourself if you want to throw a question in or contribute something there yeah we were we were just kind of talking earlier about women not want to have sex with you when you kind of give into every whim that they want right yeah wasn't the case with me at all the more that i just allowed her to run things the more sex that i got when i would push back and try to be against the things she wanted she would turn cold. She wouldn't be in the mood, those kind of things. And I mean, it was, it, it would just really kind of mess with your head. Cause it's like, okay, well, if I want to stay in this relationship with this individual, I've got to get, and it was just, it was really taxing for a long time, but it's, it's interesting kind of a segue into what you guys were talking about just a second ago with how there's a direct relation of how they're going to act based off of how their parents act. And this individual had a very short view. She could flip on like, like a light switch. And I actually saw her mother behave in a lot of the same ways that she would behave to me. Everything would be perfectly fine through the day. Everything would just be great. You're giving her everything that she wants. It's the perfect day for us and our children and everything. And the second that she feels slighted at all, you were just the absolute enemy, the worst person in the world. And I saw her mom actually act like this flip out on her because she stood up for a kid. And it was, it was just a nightmare all the way around, but it was a complete opposite thing for me. You know, like, the more I gave, the more sex that I got. And it really fucked with my what, head. Was it, was it enthusiastic, genuine desire, or was it like transactional sex, like starfish sort of sex? No, no, no. It was enthusiastic, like porn style. The kind of shit that you guys talk about with borderline personality disordered women of how they would just suck you in and just give you the best sex of your life. That is exactly what I experienced on a daily basis when I wanted it. But sometimes I'm feeling like I'm yeah. just being used and I wouldn't want to do anything with her. And she would get upset with me, you know, and would start accusing me of that. I've got other women and why I'm not wanting to be intimate with her. And it's like, damn, I just feel like I'm a plow horse. You're using me for my money. You're, you know, you're only happy when I'm buying things. I'm doing everything that you want to do. The second that I want to do something for myself, I get all this pushback and then it's just fucking hell breaks loose. Sorry for yeah. the cursing. But, no, know. no, no, that's fine. Like, but, 
But I mean, you don't strike me as a beta male. I mean, like you look masculine, you look like an alpha, you got the biggest ass <laughs> biceps we've, you know, we had on the show ever, you know, uh, very nice, majestic beard, if I might add. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you yeah, very yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> but um, normally like, like she would be enthusiastic, I would imagine, because of the alpha cred. But I mean, at the same time, she's still trying to beta tize you and control you with the sex. What's your take on that, Sean? Yeah, I'm intrigued yeah. by this. How long did this go on? Two years. Two years? That's a long run. It was uh, It was a lot. And, and, and I'll just be honest with you. It really, a lot of it had to do with, I met her at a time when I've been a single father for you know, nine years now. And I met her at a time I was getting out of the military. I was trying to want to kind of settle down and have like a support system at home. And I met her, she was a single mom. She was five years older than me and was really attractive and actually lived right down the street from me. I'd never met her before. And we just kind of hit it off, but it was just really fast. A lot of sex, a lot of stories of abuse of, of men beating her, all this other kind of stuff, you know? So of course I just believed every bit of it. Now, me before this individual always had a rule. I'm never going to date a single mom, even though I'm a single dad. I don't give a shit. I don't want their baby daddy drama and all this other kind of crap. I just don't want to deal with it. Also, if the woman is that good looking and she's that much and she's that old and she's still single, run, there's something wrong with her. But for whatever reason, this individual, I let every bit of that down. So a lot of the teachings that everyone has with this red pill theory and, and things to look out for, I believed in that wholeheartedly until I met the right person to tear every one of those walls down. And it, it drug me through a lot of things. I mean, this individual tried to get me fired from my job one time, all kind of stuff, but I kept going back to her. I kept believing that this person was only acting like this because of me. Even after reaching out to a couple of their exes and then telling me very similar stories of things that happened with them. So it really was a lot of, I had low self, low, low self esteem and it broke me down. And I just kept going back to her thinking that that was what I deserved because I made her act that way in some way. It was crazy. That was a couple of big red flags there. She tried to interfere with your job. She was gaslighting you, making right. you believe that this was your fault. Oh yeah. 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 Or, or any problems were your fault. Yeah. And like you said, one of the big things that, and I heard you talking about it last week was that they want to control your behavior to, to fix, to help their emotions out kind of thing. And that, that really, spoke volumes to me and made me understand it even more that that was really what was going on. She was trying to make herself feel better by controlling me rather than dealing with her own emotions and her re what was really going on. Mm -hmm. Josh, for, Josh I'm curious. For, that it sounds like she got off on the control, like got off on the control aspect. Yeah, what absolutely. Yeah. 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 Huh. So the, the sex, was it, was it consistent for that in two, entire two years that as long as you did what you were supposed to do, that the sex was enthusiastic? Yes. Always enthusiastic. I mean, the, you're the sexiest man I've ever met. I mean, I can't live without you. All the things whispering into you are doing anything, anything that I ever wanted to do, I could do with her. I'm talking, it, it didn't matter. I'm sure if I said, hey, I want to defecate on you because I would like to do this, she would do it. I have no doubt in my mind that she would do that. Did you get a sense from her that you went from being an angel idealized to being a devil and you were just the worst person in the world absolutely. and then back again? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It sounds a hell of a lot like borderline, right? But on the same, but on the same aspect, I never was like this with anybody before, but her waves of up and down peaking started to put me on that to where I would get to the point where I would think she was amazing, but then she would do something that would piss me off. And I'm like, you know, I would just throw my hands up and run. And through some of the researches that I've done, you know, uh, of psychology and stuff, it, it seems like I picked up on some of her behaviors, but in where it was more CPTSD for me, whereas this is her behavior because she's borderline me. I'm just kind of mimicking what I'm going through, the trauma that I'm dealing with with this person for an extended amount of time. Yeah. Because I've never been like that in a relationship before, ever. And hopefully never again. Right. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you'll see that train coming uh, long before it arrives at the station next time, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a great learning experience. And I know you got like, this is before the train wreck, but it has been a long, ongoing process. And it has just, it took so much to really pull me out of something. And then what really finally pulled me out of it was the thought of 
if my daughter's mother had her, because I have custody of my child, but if my if the, uh, the roles were reversed and my daughter's mother had her in a position like this with a woman that's back and forth, is controlling behavior, all this, I would fight tooth and nail to pull my child out of that. And when I, I had that just light go off in my head and I'm like, well, I'm just being the biggest hypocrite in the world to subject my child to this kind of behavior from someone because that's not the kind of woman that I want my child to model herself as, yeah. as a woman these days. But the bad thing about this woman was she could cook. I mean, she was amazing. She was super sexy, great sex, kept a clean house, made a house feel like a home. Like when it comes to the traditional kind of things of a woman, she was about that. Like when it comes to red pilled kind of woman, she wanted the kind of male female roles and stuff, but she was such a control freak and just had so like crap going on in her life. It was always, it was always a bad time. Mm. Yeah. She sounds tormented. I, I hope she's doing well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably, Sean, probably. You're a kind man. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, sorry to kind of go on a rant with it, but you know, I haven't really spoken about a lot of these things in an open format like this. Obviously I've, I've talked with my friends before and John yeah. from modern life dating, uh, modern life uh, dating, I'd kind of talked with him some very small things about it, but it was, it was a bad time. So I hope these guys can really pick up on that. Cause a lot of the things that Rolo teaches and other people look at when you meet this woman and it seems like your ship has just come in all of a sudden, you've got to be careful because that's exactly how I felt. And I thought I hit the lot of them. You know? Let me ask you a yeah, question you, before we let you go, because um, because I got that link that I just posted there. So, guys, if you want to join and ask questions, uh, tonight's show is not call in. Just hit that Hangout link. You'll need to launch it from a Android device or an iOS with Hangouts on it or just launch it from Chrome. Uh, you can hop in and ask a question. But, um, I mean, if you could kind of live, leave people with, like, a closing sort of um, – nugget you know if you would like a little bit of wisdom sorry ryan i'm just gonna mute you while uh we're just finishing up with barrett um what you know if you could kind of go back in a time machine and, and have a conversation with yourself to warn you what would you tell yourself would be the red flag that would indicate like everything that came after it <sighs> I mean, really, I guess I would need to assess the situation. Like, look at what you've got going on here. You've got a woman that is extremely attractive, who is a single mother, who's telling you all these stories that the father has just never been around. You know, like really dig into what's going on with that. Really observe what's going on and, and pay attention to her behavior and really ignore her beauty, because that was one of the biggest things for me. She was like a siren. She just drew me in. She knew exactly what to say. She knew exactly what to do. And if they're, you know, we kind of talk about in the red pill community, like don't, if she makes you wait for the sex, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. It's not really going to be worth it. Yeah. But in this case, when they want to be sexual so quick, I'm talking the first time you ever hang out with them and then they're wanting you to be back and more and more and more. That's a huge red flag. So just watch out for the aggressiveness, if anything. And if it seems too good to be true, it likely is because this caliber of a woman, what she looked like and the appearance, I'd never had that before. So if they're coming out of the woodwork like that all of a sudden, and you've never been with someone like that before, really assess yourself. Did my game just get super tight all of a sudden? No, it didn't. Something's going on with this individual. Yeah, trust but so you, verify, right? Yeah, you said something earlier. You said your ship has come in, and this is a huge red flag. When you're being idealized, you're the perfect man, and she's the perfect woman, and she's got you up on a pedestal, and you can do no wrong, that's a very bad sign at the beginning of yeah. a relationship. Yeah, and, and I met her about a month before Father's Day, and she wanted to take me to, you know, to a casino out of Mississippi and, you know, and, and take me to this favorite restaurant that she had. And she wanted to pay for everything. And while we're sitting at dinner, I was like, you know, why did you want to do this? And she's like, because I can tell that no woman has ever appreciated you the way that you should, the way that you should be as a man. I mean, just blowing my head up because inside I had, you know, I'd, I'd really never had a woman that I felt saw that in me being a single father and and being a strong, you know, strong masculine man, I'd never really had that appreciation from someone. And then all and, of a sudden, uh, somebody shows up on your front porch and gives you everything that you ever wanted. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. 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 So there sometime, Rich, we should talk about being idealized versus having a woman infatuated with you, because there's there's some subtleties there. And all right. Well, maybe we'll hop on that tonight um, if we're a little slower with the join-ins because we don't have the call system running. But yeah, let's kind of leave that on the uh, table. But thanks for hopping on, Barrett. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rich. I appreciate it. All right, man. See you later. Peace. Right. See you, Rich. I, I know we got someone on the line here, but um, can I throw some numbers at you? Yeah, let's do it. 
All right. So in the U.S., we have this uh, agency called the Centers for Disease Control, and they go around and they track all kinds of epidemiology. And part of what they track, one of the things they track is domestic violence, and they break it down into categories. So there's uh, violent aggression, and there's lower level aggression, like pushing and slapping. There's psychological abuse or psychological aggression, and there's coercive control. So coercive control is things like controlling how you spend your money, like the guy was calling before with the money, controlling yeah. where you go, who you spend your time with, managing your relationships for you. That's coercive control. It's considered an abusive behavior. And the CDC says that women versus men, there's about 17.25 million women who do this in a 12 month, that's their 12 month prevalence estimate versus 12.5 million. So women are much higher in the, um, in the area of coercive control, according to the CDC, is like 5.25% versus 3.8% of men who are doing this coercive control. The good news is that 95, if the stats are accurate, 95% of women aren't doing this stuff. So that's the good news. The bad news is, I was thinking about this today when, when we were getting ready for the show, is that um, I don't think Ryan's one of these guys, but I think there's 5% of guys that will go out of their way unintentionally and they will find this five percent of these women that are coercive and controlling and they'll repeat this relationship over and over again because i hear so many guys that just have the same relationship one after another so there's something in them that's seeking out these women yeah if i can if i can kind of be so bold to speak to this um i almost wonder if it's all men that um at some point inherently like within them want to be admired and idealized by a woman um, because not many women will do it. So when you have those sirens that show up that do all of those wonderful things like Barrett was kind of describing, that's when you're like, oh, finally, I've, you know, I found the one. And it's, you know, it's almost like that one-itis appears on your front porch and then you, you kind of go along for the ride. But boy, hold on, because, it, you know, it can be pretty crazy along the way, right? Yeah, I, f I fell into that trap once. Oh, yeah, I mean, once. we all have. Yeah. <laughs> once. I, I, I'll yeah. be honest, it was more than once for me, but yeah, for sure. Um, Ryan, do you want to un unmute yourself? You got a, a question or something you want to contribute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me okay? You're loud and clear, dude. Great. Um, so completely agree with the last caller. Um, I've had situations where I've dated women that really, they can be so manipulative sometimes that uh, – they can, once they get what they want, they seem to have more transactional sex. Um, and I want to just talk about kind of this current situation, at least with the girlfriend that I have right now. Um, so mom and daughter are really strong-headed. Father is absolutely beta male. Um, and I don't know if it has to do kind of with um, the religion, because they're really strong Christians. They actually run like a... Uh, a church and the father works part time and it seems like the father is the only one that actually works. But any time that the mother speaks, the father doesn't really communicate. He's really shy. He's really kind of like beta male, um, at least from what I've watched her show quite a bit. Um, but the family loves me quite a bit. They see me as like a really good provider. Um, they see me as more of like role model of how they want their son to be. Um, and really, I just wanted to talk about when, like, a girl throws hints in terms of, for example, uh, my girlfriend likes a lot of really nice things in terms of, like, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, stuff like that. Anytime that I give her nice things, she'll sometimes throw out hints that say, hey, I want you to buy me this. Would you be willing to buy me this? And kind of coerce me, kind of like um, what Sean was talking about they tend to be a little bit leading to something that makes sense. What do you think about that? It, Sean, actually, before you get to that, I want to ask you about this like five lo love language stuff because one of these like supposed love languages is like gifts. You know, there's words of affirmation, and then there's another one, you know, for gifts. Do you think that that's legit or is that manufactured? Like, what is that? Yeah, I, th I think it's legit enough. I can't remember the guy's name. It'll come to me in a minute. But yeah, it's, it's, fair i mean i don't have a problem with it and if it's useful for people cool use it mm -hmm. okay so to ryan's point you know with his observation what do you think about that i would be i'd be curious first of all i'd be asking her questions about what do you think you about your parents relationship and what do you think about the power dynamic and what do you expect going forward just have a frank conversation about that 
Yeah, that's that's probably a good way to place it. And sorry, Ryan, I just muted you because there was some feedback coming from your speakers. But if you want to just chime back in. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I don't know if it has anything to do with their religion. I mean, I'm a Christian myself, but I don't necessarily believe that uh, I should just become completely beta from that. Um, let me just say that uh, I always have to come back to your show because in the long term, whenever my girlfriend comes into ovulation, I start to realize that she has a tendency to become more strong headed and less submissive in terms of uh, she can have a tendency to be more assertive, more like, I don't want to do it this way. And she'll be more argumentative. Um, she'll start uh, just, we'll start arguing more often around that time. Um, yeah. Yeah. It just, it, it tosses me sometimes that uh, it, it can be a little bit difficult to, that time to talk to her let me ask how you long question. you been with this lady yeah go ahead Sean. about a year and a half year and a half so have you had this conversation with her have you noticed with her this this power dynamic between the parents I haven't at that um no. talked about their family and just in general everyone in their family is married and they're all together so relationally uh in terms of like everybody's brother and sister in that family is a Hispanic family. So you have about six or seven brothers and sisters in terms of like what the mom has and father has, but everybody in, in terms of uh, the like family's married and is still married. So, right. Yeah. So, it, it would be a tricky, con I'll be done here in just a second. Yeah, yeah, it would be a tricky yeah. conversation to have with her about the power dynamic because you might get an honest answer. Like she might say to you, Oh, I, I want somebody who wears the pants in the family. If that's what you want to do, that might be an honest answer. It might not be an honest answer. You'd have to have that conversation, then watch what happens and then have another conversation and kind of feel it out over time because words and behaviors, as you know, don't always match up. So Ryan, how old are you? 25. And how old is she? 21. She's 21. And like, would you describe her as materialistic? You know, yeah. Um, so what does that look like? Is that like handbags and shoes or stuff she can't afford? Stuff she can't afford. And I heard you say earlier when you were describing the family that her family really likes you and they see you as a provider. They didn't say they like you, they like your job, they think you're funny. <laughs> they they look at you as a provider. What does that mean? Well, I mean, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, in terms of what they bring in. Income wise, uh, I mean, they're not very like rich. Um, I sometimes feel like they act like they're rich, but in terms of how they see me as a provider, um, I make substantially more like a, a software engineer um, that uh, is very frugal with my money. So in terms of uh, uh, like how, how I spend my money is not like I'm not out here trying to buy like Louis Vuitton or I'm not out here trying to buy new sneakers and stuff like that. I'm very frivolous. I have paid off car. I'm a little, I pay all my school, stuff like that. And, um, how is she with money? How's your girlfriend with money? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, she's really, she lives with her parents. Um, she's going to school and I mean, she, doesn't really have money really they she gets money from them in terms of if she needs like glasses or she needs food um when you say glasses are you talking like reading glasses or are we talking like louis Vuitton sunglasses <laughs> like prescription glasses that look really nice like gucci glasses or something like that okay so she's got more than one pair of glasses then because it has to match her handbag and shoes yep so right now in the chat, people are starting to say red flag, spin more plates, you know, stuff like that. So you've been seeing her for how long? About a year? About a year and a half, yeah. And what's the long-term plan with this one? I spin stuff like that. So you've been seeing her for how long? About a year? Guys, make sure when you hop on, you just mute yourself, please. Thanks. Sorry, what was the question? So you've been seeing her, seeing her for about a year. So what's the long-term plan? Um, Long-term plan is to see how well this goes. Um, I know I know a little bit of the concept of spinning plates, and I've read 
like some of the books, like uh, trying to remember, like uh, Red Pill, mm-hmm. the book in particular that you're talking about. Um, really, it's just to scope out this relationship to see how long that I want to be in this. I've spun plates when I was a little bit younger, but I started not liking it as much as I thought I would. I was wanting something a little more stable. Mm-hmm. And you find this this is more stable for you? Um, in terms of what she believes in terms of a family, yes. Um, sometimes a little bit worrisome in terms of how she spends money because I don't necessarily agree with everything that she does in terms of spending money. Okay, like what? And I'm and I'm just trying to pick on you a little bit here because I think that this is uh this is actually going somewhere. Okay, um, like for example, when with and I'll just give a current situation with them right now. When they're running the church, sometimes they have to use the money that they have for their house. They have to use it to spend for the church. So, um. I just tend to find that when I see her wardrobe, when I see what she wears, when I see the clothes that she wears, when I see that her going out um, and spending money that she doesn't have, uh, I tell her, I'm like, well, I mean, think about this long term. Um, if you, I read a lot about like finance and Dave Ramsey and such that, just making sure that um, in long term that we're going to be able to provide. I want to be able to buy my own house in the future. I want to be able to um, pay everything in cash in terms of that. But I just mentioned to her every now and then that long term, this isn't going to be financially. um, You're you're not going to be able to uh, finance this for the rest of your life. She doesn't have any debt or anything like that in particular. But um, we had this discussion. It's just I just mentioned to her about the fact that you cannot live like paycheck to paycheck in terms of living like this. So it sounds to me like you got your head screwed on, right? You have an idealization in your head about what a, what a good LTR would look like. You're 25, right? Yeah. So like, have you ever been single or have you always dated somebody consistently? Um, I mean, I've been single when I turned 21, I kind of went celibate and just, uh, I didn't really date women. I kind of screwed around. Do you want to do you want to jump in here, Sean? Because I'm seeing a train wreck unfold here. <laughs> I want to get to this guy before he makes a mess of his life. Uh, you're muted. I don't know if you're talking, but go ahead, Sean. Can you hear me? There you go. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know what happened there. All the guys in the track in the uh, chat saying you need to dump her she's 21 and i'm not hearing anything that can't be resolved unless there's going to be a power struggle and if there's going to be a power struggle you two got some pretty big differences like the fourth thing you're talking about ltr right there's four things that'll really trash a long-term relationship and that is differences in children religion money and sex those are the big four and i don't know where you are on the other three but it sounds like money you got some differences and What's your sense? Can you work this out with her? Or are you going to need to find somebody that scores all four? Sorry, Ryan, you're muted. I just had to mute you because of feedback. No, those are good points. Um, in terms of the other three, in terms of sex, family, and religion, we agree on those. Um, but finances is just a little bit of struggle. And I just come from a background. Um, I came I came up very poor, so I mm-hmm. tried to make a lot of changes in my family. Um I don't know necessarily her background, but from what I know that how she spends her money, she tries to live very rich. But I she, you said she comes from a kind of a, you didn't say poverty stricken, but she comes from a poor family, right? She does right now because um, just this trend, I mean, it might have been different in the past because um, they may have more money, but now they don't have as much. Hey, Ryan. Um with all these nice, expensive things that she likes, how is she on social media? How does she use social media? Um, so she likes Facebook and Instagram, definitely. Um, since our relationship has come about, she's just really posted really about us. Um, occasionally when, and this is something I picked up on a little bit when I was watching your show, is you mentioned how women tend to um, 
when they become hypergamous, they tend to post more on social media, whether it be a little bit more cleavage, a little bit more that. Sometimes I notice when we get into arguments that she can be a little bit more, I, won't, I don't want to say revenge-ish, but how do I explain it? She tends to post more on Facebook in terms of uh, Facebook or Instagram photos about, I mean, I guess her herself just in stories and such that. But in terms of just social media in general, she just, in terms of like Instagram posts and such that, she just uh, like has us on right now. Mm, okay. All right. Well, I want to move over to the other callers, but just, you know, just give this some thought because this, this to me, as a guy that's in, you know, the credit business and has done it for well over 20 years now, is a train wreck unfolding on the money scope of things. You guys are not on the same page when it comes to managing money. Um, she likes to spend it. She doesn't make it. You make it. You were looked at as a beta provider. Also, when you've got a little bit of conflict going on, she's posting provocative photographs on social media. And hypergamy doesn't kick in. It's always on, okay, for women. It's like their sexual strategy is open hypergamy, which is looking for the highest value man that they can lock down. And if she's not seeing things going in her direction in the relationship, then when she's posting more provocative pictures when there's conflict, she's basically saying, hey, guys, I'm over here. Pay attention to me. Check it out. Look at this. So just be aware of what's going on. I mean, at 25, if I were you, I wouldn't be looking at an LTR right now. I'd be, I'd be laying the foundation to your life building whatever business it is that you're creating, saving up money, and just kind of like learning about basic red pill tenants and female nature so you don't end up in a scenario in two years' time where you've wiped up a 23-year-old that has a bunch of student loan debt and uh, would easily monkey branch off and take half your shit and the kids. Just, um, you know, just trying to, you know, throw some love out there to your brother. Agreed. Well, I and I would, I would add to that that um, you both come from – you both don't come from money, right? You're getting squared away on the money front and you should keep doing that. And everything Rich just said about like you build your foundation. If she's putting up a fight about that, why on earth would you waste time? Because that goes against your mission. Ryan, she is replaceable. You don't have to worry about that. You'll, you'll be just fine. All right. Um, hey guys. Yeah, man. Thanks for hopping on. I'm going to let you go. Um, Anything before we go to the next um, guy that joined on the Hangout, Sean? Yeah, just that she's 21, and keep that in mind. Like she's she's, if she's willing to join if she's willing to join in on the um, on this mission to get money squared away. Cool. If she's not, then all right. It's yeah, an but, awfully they're both awfully young to be making these big decisions when their values aren't squared away. Yeah, totally agree. Um, Lendon, I think you're on first. You want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, fire away, man. Okay. All right. So, guys, I, I made uh, 30 this year. Uh, in May of this year, I made 30. Uh, so this uh, – um, and the, 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 the young lady that I'm with, I've been with her now for about four years. So I met her when I was 26 years old. Um, I, I had a daughter really young. I had a, uh, my first kid when I was 19, and uh, she had a two-year-old son when we met. So uh, – so again, this is about four years ago, and right off of the bat, you know, I, I've detected a couple of red flags. Uh, the first one was the conversation where we had we had over the phone. Um, well, first of all, before I met her, I had played around a bunch, and I had sort of declared to myself that my next girlfriend was going to be my wife. And uh, so when I met her, it was kind of like. Uh, I think the guy's name was Barrett. It was kind of like this kind of aha moment where it was, well, not aha moment, but this epiphany where it was her and she was doing all the things that I think I, I thought I wanted her to do, et cetera, et cetera. So the first red flag was, for me, was a conversation we had, and I forget exactly how the conversation went, but the way she made me feel uh, basically was, that I was, she was lucky to have me, and that I was, I was basically too good. Oh, hope we uh -oh. don't. It was going somewhere. Lennon, you still there? We yeah. might have lost. Oh. So okay, I'm gonna have to move around now. 
Yeah, uh, I think your Wi-Fi way. signal is a little weak. If you can back up about 10 seconds and just repeat what you were saying there. Okay. So I met first red flag was she said something to me that made me kind of feel like I'm, I'm switching them, uh, that I was too good for her. Like I was a catch. But it was in a way that it, may, it, it basically said I was, on a, I was on a different level from her. And at first it flattered me, but then I, I went through this thing where I'm, uh, I said to, to her, I said, I don't know about that. You know what, Lyndon? Kill your, kill your video and just run audio. See if that solves it, because it seems like your bandwidth is getting eat up. Oh, we lost him. Okay, well, that story didn't go anywhere. Um, impeccable. You're up, brother. You're muted, so just unmute yourself. There you go. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Awesome. What's going on, fellas? Appreciate all the info, everything you guys bring. Found you guys about uh, eight months ago now. Uh, <clears throat> I was in a relationship. It was eight years. Uh, we got married. It was about a year and a half uh, marriage. And <clears throat> around Thanksgiving, actually on Thanksgiving, she decided that she wasn't going to come home on time like she normally did. And I was wondering where she was and, and uh, nowhere to be found, wasn't answering the phone. And come to find out, you know, leaving the gym, oh, I got caught up with some friends and, and uh, lost track of time. Well, same thing happened the next day and then comes home the next weekend. And sure enough, she had met a friend and, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, things that happened, things that were unrepairable that happened. So I guess really I'm just kind of giving you a, a base to, to what is going on, what I've dealt with the last eight months. Um, I'm a guy that kind of uh, – I kind of walk the line and I can't really decide on, uh, you know, this side or this side. And what interests me tonight about what we're talking about is, you know, the control freak thing because she was very good at making me – of guilt tripping and making me think – that, you know, I was the one doing these things wrong and, and I was the one making the, the wrong decisions and, and wasn't doing things for her. And so this, this control freak kind of thing, I have a hard time where, I don't know, if I was being controlling when I was putting my foot down saying, no, we can't do that. Uh, you know, we bought a, bought a house and we got married and uh, we had moved to, from, to another state about a thousand miles away. We did all that in one year. Let me just let me just back you up for a sec, because I mean, you said something about her going out on Thanksgiving, and things happened. So, so what things happened? Well, so she had met somebody at the gym, uh huh. And you know, her story is at that time. You know, everybody tells me don't be don't be silly. It happened a long time ago, but uh, you know, the story that all I've gotten from her is that it happened around that time, and then a couple of days after Thanksgiving, she had come home from the gym in the morning. And said she was going to go out with a friend and she had gone out for the night and then called me at like 11 o'clock at night and was like, I'm not coming home. So she was out with a dude from the gym parking him. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, and you guys are married. Oh, we were married. Yeah. We we're married for uh, last year and a half in the state that I live in. You actually have to be separated for a year before you can officially get divorced, which is awesome. So uh, we're still technically married. So she's moved away to another state uh, with okay. this dude. Yeah. So. Okay. Got it. Okay. So I mean, like, she's a monkey branch over to the gym, dude. So, what's the yeah. question? Or is this an experience that you're sharing? Well, well, so what interests me about the topic today is is talking about control freaks. You know, I'm I'm I have a hard time deciding in my mind whether you know some of the things were her fault or my fault, and I just you know I battle with myself all the time. So I'm wondering if you know, like you guys talk about uh, uh, women women having you know being controlling in in certain ways, or or let me start over the men wanting to be the ones to kind of separate and, and make things happen and say, this, this is how it goes and this is what we're going to do. And, you know, so was I controlling and putting my foot down when I said we didn't have money to do this and we couldn't go out and do this and we couldn't buy this for the house. And is, is, is that controlling or was it more controlling for her when, when she wanted to get things when I told her she couldn't or, or wanted to, uh, you know, guilt trip me into going and, spending a week vacation with friends when I told her that we wouldn't be able to do that, you know, would... so, it sounds to me like you're holding on to some ownership here that you don't need to hold on to. <laughs> yeah. Shot, yeah. Shot, jump yeah. in here, man. Help yeah. The thing about not, not having enough money. I mean, that's not, that's not a control thing. That's just math. If you don't have the money, you don't have the money. Right. Yeah. yeah it's just, yeah. yeah. It's just a math thing. Right. It's got nothing to do with control. I mean, if, I mean, 
if a woman is going to go and bang another dude, if you're married, it's because she sees him as higher value than you. It's really, you know, it's really all that it boils down to, like marriage, re you know, religion, <clears throat> Christianity. None of those things are like buffers from hypergamy, right? So, it, like, on a scale of 1 to 10, when you were married, when she did what she did, were you the best version of yourself? Were you a 10? Were you the absolute best version of yourself? Or were you like a 4? Like, shit wasn't going your way. I feel like I feel like in the, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning I was. You know, I got a lot of good friends. I got a lot of a lot of alpha friends. We do a lot of a lot of alpha stuff, and and you know, I was very good at saying like, "This is how it is. This is what we're gonna do." Uh, mm -hmm. I think that she was just really good at slowly kind of inching in and making me a little softer and getting me to give in to a few more things. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and so I think it's kind of partly like you guys say, where if you don't kind of put your foot down and don't bring out that alpha side you know they lose respect for you a little bit well and so i think that can, might play into it too but yeah yeah but i mean like you can go around putting your foot down if you know if you're a four it doesn't mean that she's going to comply yeah right so yeah. on a scale of one to ten at that time with ten being the best version of yourself and one being the worst where would you place yourself well when she when she ran off yeah uh I'd say probably a five or six because, like I said, she. Okay, so stop there. So that's the only thing that you have to take ownership for is you weren't the best version of you. As yeah. far as what she did, you you have no owner you have no ownership to take for that. That's just female yeah. nature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, do you yeah. want to chime yeah. in? Yeah. So yeah, I guess yeah, I guess the, the I just want to make sure that you know moving forward, you know, with with finding new new partners and things like that. I guess that's just some women, weird. women hate weak men. Women hate men that are not pursuing excellence. Yeah. And yeah. if you met her, you know, doing your thing and you were top shelf and you were like nine out of 10 sort of thing on your own game and you kind of relax and you got down to like a four or five, you can't be surprised if she's going to start porking the guy from the gym. Right. I mean, like at some point, something like that may or may not happen, you know, depending on what her value is and the dynamic of the relationship. But I'm going to shut up because I want the clinical psychologist to chime in. Here. <laughs> Why is that? I just noticed this interesting disparity between the two scenarios that you're presenting. Like on the one hand, you're presenting that she's porking the dude at the gym. But then on the other hand, you're talking about wondering if you were being controlling when the math said that you couldn't spend money. And it's it's such a trivial issue compared to this other thing, which suggests, like Rich said earlier, that you're hanging on to some ownership that maybe you don't need to hang on to. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, the money is just kind of one example as well. You know, obviously in a relationship, there's so many different angles, but, you know, there, there she sing like, hang, on, hang on a sec. Did she yeah. sing you some lyrics like you were too controlling and that's why I went and did what I did? Uh, I'm sure she said something near the end, you know, she had disappeared a couple months later. So really I've only talked to her a few times since like February, yeah. but, but, but there were times in the relationship where, uh, you, you know, like the, the way the relationship started, I'm a real sarcastic kind of outright guy. And so some people can see it as an asshole. She was very good at seeing it as flirty as playful and more near the end, you know, she would start to say, can you stop, not be as much of an asshole to me as you are and stuff like that. And so the same sort of thing came down to, to uh, uh, that aspect of it, where it was like she was kind of—it seemed like she was just kind of getting tired of things and 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 was trying to dig her heels in a little more. I think she wanted to move things along a little faster than I wanted to, like all doing right, the wedding, so, buying the house, doing all that kind of stuff. So, all right. So let me ask you a question. Let's take Rolo Tomasi to task. So, how old was she when this all happened? Uh, when we met, I was twenty. She was nineteen, and I was twenty-two. And then uh, now she left in November. She was. 27 and I'm 31. And, Ro and Rolo Tomasi is right again. She was in the epiphany <laughs> phase. She was just hitting it. What's that? What do you say? Epiphany phase. That's when women, you know, have like the come to Jesus thought in their head about I need to find the right guy and get right yeah. with God yeah. and, you know, sort it yeah. out. And she probably thought that you weren't the right guy. And, you know, that's yeah. part of the reason why she well, took that opportunity to do what she did. Oh, and also and, not to make it make it any any more complicated. And sorry to cut you off, but yeah. you know she also dealt real bad with anxiety. And so you know I I've always worked my ass off. I work any overtime I can. I've I've had a time where I was working four different jobs. Uh, you know I, I do I do electrical work, and so I do side work, and I do all this different stuff. And uh, you know so I was super stressed out because she was spending the money, and I was trying to pay the bills, the debts off. 
And so she didn't realize that I was so stressed. And then she's wondering why I'm not dealing with her anxiety. And I'm thinking, why don't you deal with your anxiety? I'm dealing with my stress. Why don't you do, you know what I mean? So I just. So we need some higher functioning women in your life. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That, build your foundation, go monk mode for a while. Start, yeah. start. Yeah. You guys didn't have any kids, right? No, luckily we got, got out of the marriage early kids. Uh, you I don't have to pay alimony for, for marriage, like so I don't have to worry about anything. What's that? You don't have to pay alimony for the rest of your life or anything? No, no. Uh, I don't think she has rights to the house. My attorney's told me since I bought the house before she we got actually married that she her name isn't on anything or anything. All right. Well, count your blessings. Impact. Yeah, well, that's what it says. Count your blessings, yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. Inexpensive hand, lesson. Hand, yeah, it, it didn't cost you that much. I've made much more expensive mistakes than that. And, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm taking taking it as a blessing and trying to move forward in, in more business and real estate. I've got some friends I want to jump in with. So cool, so. cool. All right. Well, thanks for hopping in, man. I'm going to let you go. Okay. Thanks. I yeah, appreciate it, fellas. All right. So there you have it, folks. If uh, your woman's at her epiphany phase and you're not demonstrating excellence, this could happen too. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with be controlling. Don't worry about that part. Um, did you get your audio fixed, London? If you want to chime back in and kind of finish that story. Yeah, my, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Do you want to kill your video feed? Just run audio just in case it does it again. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, my audio and my video is fine. She actually showed up to the house, the, the lady I'm talking about. So. I didn't want to. Oh, okay. All right. So carry on with the story. Okay. So the lady. So, yeah. so um, she, she had this. So uh, I was talking about the red flag. The first red flag was this comment that she made that it red flag. It, the red flag to me was that she was insecure and that this was probably going to be a problem. And I, I let it flatter me because it was like, you know, I was doing my thing, but I let it flatter me and it, and it kind of just washed over. But that comment and that energy I got from that, that phone call ended up being sort of a tone of the rest of our relationship. Um, the second major red flag was that her, uh, her dad died before she was born, and her mom was accused uh, of, of being the killer. And But she was, she was uh, no charges were pressed or anything like that. And that's something totally weird in itself. But the fact that she never had uh, a male role model coming up um, to look at and say, okay, this is, this is how men are. And, and having that experience, I think really, it kept her from both. It keeps her because this is, a, this is something that's happening now. And I'm trying to uh, avoid the train wreck. Uh, but uh, it keeps her from understanding uh, the value that I bring to the family because now we have a son together. And I think it also, it, I feel like it also, um, she, she doesn't understand the value of her own uh, womanhood and wifehood in that regard. Um, so anyways, we're, we're going through the relationship. I mean, it's up and down from the beginning. Uh, she breaks up with me every, uh, at least, every single month, at least once a month, we're breaking up again. And I remember joking to her in the beginning of the relationship that at this rate, you're going to break up with me every month of this relationship. And she, it actually has happened. So and, question, what was she breaking up with you over? Uh, go ahead. Sorry, just for clarity, but what was she breaking up with you over? Oh, do we got another audio problem here? All right, London's out. We're going to have to let you go, bro. That's, yeah. uh, that's too bad, man, because that story would have been interesting. Um, Josh, I want to put you just ahead of the line just because you're in the community, and I always give you guys front of the row access. you want to un unmute yourself? Let me, let me talk about Lennon for a minute here, though. Yeah, yeah, okay. Can, go I, ahead. can I respond to that one? Yeah, go. I like the cut of his jib. He's a thoughtful dude, and he's rocking a good mustache, and he's thinking about what's going on. And I don't know if this girl's in therapy. He didn't talk about that, but how do you grow up? in that kind of situation that she grew up in and have any trust for anybody, male or female. No wonder she's breaking up with him every month. So if there's wow. any way to get her into therapy and help her figure out, this doesn't need to be a lifelong thing, but help her figure out what her story is so that she doesn't have to do this for the rest of her life and mess up their kids, that might be one way to go. Was I the only one that picked up on the fact that her mom might have been a murderer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting detail. <laughs> That was that was kind of like the biggest, you know. That was like the entire red flag going up there. That was like yeah, that, that's right. 
That's the part that's got me wondering, how does she trust anybody? Well, you know, raised by a mom that might have been potentially a murderer. I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. Um, Josh, did you want to get her into therapy? You're muted. You're unmuted. You're muted. No, it's not working out for you, bud. Okay, is that working out? There you go. There was like a three second delay every time I hit the button, so I didn't know what was going on. Okay, so this is a bit of an experience from my really only LPR. Um, so it was definitely like a, a one itis situation with my first LTR came like later in my life. I'm actually a lot older than I look, and like, uh, you know, my mindset was like, she's really hot, she's out of my league. She totally loved Bonnie. There was lots of sex at the beginning of the relationship. And she didn't really need to control me. Uh, I just offered myself as a doormat, essentially. Uh, but whenever I wanted to initiate sex, obviously it wouldn't be quite as physical as most guys do it. It would be more verbal, right? Uh, but then kind of at the end of our relationship, she started saying some crap like I was verbally pressuring her into sex and stuff like that, and it just it, it like it just didn't make sense to me because it, there there's definitely no way I could coerce sex even slightly in a physical way, and then she started telling people that I was coercing her for sex and stuff like that, and I'm just wondering. Um, you know, my reputation has been a bit smeared with some, you know, former mutual friends and stuff like that. Uh, how do I deal with that? Well, dude, like, you're in a wheelchair, right? And she's and she's accusing you of forcing her to be sexual, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me either. But, you know, when somebody who has been a victim of sexual assault like she had been in the past says that and we live in a culture of believe all women um you know even a disabled guy is you know the rapist now yeah we, <laughs> me too knows no bounds yeah so what joshua why did you offer yourself up as a doormat what's going on there well like i said i'm a lot older than i look i'm 37 um uh, i First time LTR ever. First time ever really having a girlfriend of any significance. So, like, I thought this was, like, my one and only chance. Uh, also, like, she's really hot. She's smoking hot. So, like, I thought I hit the jackpot. I thought I had to, you know, be the uber nice guy to... All right. So, so hang on. You're coming from, you're coming from a place of desperation. Why? Is it Why? just the physical because part or what's fat, going on? Yeah. I'm a fat guy in a wheelchair, and that's not what, what did, the chicks are looking for. What else you got going on? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a smart guy. I run my own business. I'm funny. Uh, I got mm -hmm. that chick going for me. Excuse me, but you know, still, uh, first thing is what they see, right? And, uh, you know, I, I'm feeling better about myself now. I'm feeling more confident. I'm feeling that you know, I. You know, I've done it before. I could do it again. I feel better now about where I'm in life. But yeah, three, four years ago, for sure, I felt like this was like, quote unquote, my one and only chance at happiness. All right. So this the sense of desperation is coming mostly from the physical side, but you got other stuff going on. You got some business interests going on. Can you make women laugh? Definitely. Definitely. All right, so this desperation, that seems like the real problem to me. What do you think, Rich? Well, I mean, Josh is an entrepreneur. He's got a nice little business going on too, right? So he, he's like, he's a smart guy. It's just, he's, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like you said earlier, like, you know, this whole Me Too thing knows no bounds. You know, for them to come at a guy in a wheelchair with a disability is just, yeah. it, you know, it's just beyond me. Like, yeah. honestly, Josh, like I would just like ignore it. Just let your reputation speak for itself. Yeah. You know, this too shall pass. Um, I just love that you are able to go out there and you're confident in yourself in the sense that you can still engage in women, open up dialogue, and even, you know, go as far to, you know, be intimate with them. Because there's a lot of guys that just check out and give up and they're blackpilled and they hate the world. And 
screw this. I'm just going to off myself. And I just like, dude, you're, you're way ahead of those guys. So just ignore this hate and just let it go. Like this too shall yeah. pass for you. Yeah. And I like where your mind's at, where you, okay, you did it once. Now you can do it again. You do it better the next time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, right. man. Thanks, gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, brother. Thank you. Um, yeah, he's a cool guy. He's he's um, he's hopefully going to help me out in the future. He's offered to moderate the um, screening system that we're going to put together. Nice. Um, let's see here. I think Rakatos was up next. So if you want to unmute yourself, dude, go ahead. Hey, you guys hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead. Hey, uh, appreciate you guys having me on and stuff. So uh, first of all, before I start really getting into anything, I've been a military guy for a little bit. I come from a military family, so I might not be the best language, but I'll try to curb myself as much as I can. Let me just coach you one one sec very, very quickly because you got five minutes before we wrap up the show. So if I could wave a magic wand to solve your problem right now, what would that look like? You know, hit us with that. Um, when monk mode is a good idea and if too much is really a bad thing for you. And how long have you been in monk mode? Or are you uh, planning probably, on doing it? Well, I, I just recently broken it and it turned out bad for me. I wasn't on monk, I wasn't monk mode on purpose, but it's just kind of a, I guess I was like vetting really hard. I I wasn't really looking for a relationship. I'm still first time military, so I'm really focusing on that. Mm -hmm. Getting up, starting to you know, actually get a decent pay, working on my job pretty hard. And um, I was running, I was running into issues because it's pretty stressful. The job kind of sucks, so you know, I was hooking up with women every now and then, trying to see if that helped me out, and it, it relieved the stress a little bit. But you know, they they'd have some drama or some issues that I wouldn't deal with, so I just cut them off immediately. And how old are you? Uh, 22. All right. What kind of uh, clarifying questions can we get at him, Sean? The question, when when is too much monk mode? Um, <laughs> I think when you've established a foundation and you're 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 avoiding the world. Do you find yourself approach. avoiding the world and avoiding women? A little bit. Um, I'm pretty introverted overall, but I mean, I do well in groups of people. I just kind of try to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry. What are you trying to avoid? Uh, I don't, I've not been doing a whole lot of like real social stuff group with a lot of group of people lately. Just haven't really been feeling it. Uh, I, I can do it just fine. I'm, I mess pretty well in my work center and whenever we do events, but for the most part, usually I find myself like declining, you know, so it's not anxiety myself. that's keeping you home. It's just, you would rather be home. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Do you feel exhausted being by yourself or do you feel recharged being by yourself in this monk mode? It depends. It changes on day. You know, sometimes I feel great just being able to relax. You know, do you ever feel? Do you do you feel alone or do you feel lonely? I think alone would be okay. more accurate. Okay, so alone's not a bad thing. I mean, it's okay to be alone. It's just, yeah. you know, it's just when you feel like you're missing the company of people that you, you know the whole monk mode might be too much, and you don't necessarily need to fill, fill that void with a girlfriend. I mean, you can fill it with friends. You can you know you can walk your dog, whatever it might look like, but. Um, so what's the red flag? Like, why do you think that you're going into monk mode a little too deeply? Little, well, little too I'm much? worried that I might, because I just hooked up with a chick and, uh, she, she went over some stuff. She started some drama. She created a problem in my life. So I got rid of her. It was immediately red flag for me. What was that? What did she do? Uh, she kept trying to bring up like, or she'd get really defensive and insecure saying how I was cheating on her and stuff. And she tried to start these fights. Like when I was going down the highway, she decided she was going to have a shouting contest with me. And when I decided I wasn't going to engage in such shouting contests, she wanted to throw my car and park on the highway. So I had to pull off the side, turn on my hazards. And well, I ended up making her walk home. That's how we, that's how we broke up. Uh, so it was, yeah. It doesn't seem like your version of what monk mode looks like is a bad thing. It's just you setting some boundaries around what you're willing to tolerate with women. And you're saying, no, I'm not, I'm not going to let you abuse me. And it's as simple as that. I mean, you know, you're just well, vetting is then, all you're doing. The thing on top of that is like, because I mean, I, I live on a military base right now, so it wasn't really too hard to find where I worked. And uh, she ended up going to my job and she sabotaged my car. I still haven't quite figured out what she did with you. I've still been working on that the last couple of days. But uh, she fucked up my car, so it won't start. Sorry about that. And and she wanted to come into my work center and start a whole bunch of drama, which was a really bad idea because I don't know why you would think you can just kind of, you know, stir up chaos in a military work center. She got arrested quite promptly. And, She's, I, think, think she's, I, think, I think the bigger question that we should be asking is why are you having remorse over a total train wreck of a woman like this? I'm not having remorse. I'm just worried that, I mean, because after that, I, I'm feeling pretty done. I don't want to hit a point where 
I'm done turns into five years if I'm done into 10 years if I'm done. Yeah. But I mean, like, they're not all, yeah, but I mean, they're not all psychopaths. Like I've, like I've had some crazy shouting competitions with women, but I've never had one that's been like trying to put my car in park on the highway or anything like that. Right. Or even to, you know, come back and vandalize a car or to, you know, cut a brake line or prevent it from starting or show them it, you know, showing up at work and having a hissy fit at your place of employment. Like, this is just a yeah, this is this is nutty stuff. Yeah, this is like batshit crazy stuff. Like yeah. this is like, okay, I'm glad that you did this. We are done now and we can move on, sort of thing. Um, I would just keep spinning plates, dude. Like uh, I mean, just get out there, spin some plates. If they show up as you're kind of going about your day, you're getting your coffee, you talk to the pretty girl in a lineup sort of thing. Maybe you're on a, a dating app, swiping, you know, whatever. Do your thing. But I just wouldn't make it your focus, you know, make you yourself, your mission, make whatever it is you're doing in the military. Like, sorry, you said you're 25 years old? 22. 20, oh, 22. Oh, man, you're young. Like, you you don't even want to get into an LTR right now. You just want to be working on your own thing, getting some clarity, understanding what bad women look like. And you've just had, you know, like exhibit A++ sort of thing. Um, there's a lot more like that out there. There's just different versions of them. So it's just, you know, just be clear about who they are. You know, read Sean's book, Tactical Guide to Women, so you can understand, you know, what a good vetting process looks like. So you can look for the bright triad traits and avoid the dark triad sort of thing. Um, I think you got your wits about you, though. I don't think I'm pretty sure. Wrong. I mean, I think I called the red flag pretty early. I just don't know really how to avoid everything that came after, and that's kind of why I'm wanting to step away for. A yeah, while. Well, sometimes you can't avoid it. Sometimes you just kind of have to, you know, go along for the ride until you can get off, sort of thing, right? Yeah. Well, I just I don't know. Maybe I just don't like being the guy who had the psychopath come in and get arrested while we, I was at work. It's, oh, that's a great story to tell with your friends when you have a beer. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. I think I'm overthinking it. <laughs> what do you think, Sean? Yeah, I think you are overthinking. It does sound like one of the questions that you're kind of wrestling with at 22 is how much of a social life you want. So you'll yeah. get that sorted out. And that sounds like a, a separate issue to me. Yeah, that's um, yeah. you definitely save yourself a lot of hassle with this one. So congratulations there. Yeah. Appreciate All it. right, man. All right, well, that's thanks for hopping in. All right, All see right. ya. No problem. Thanks. All right, um, we got to wrap up the show now because we're coming up on the 90-minute mark. Uh, M, sorry, I won't have time to get to yours, but certainly uh, hop back in when we come back on live next time. Um, okay, next show. And before we talked about next show, I always have to mention the channel sponsor, the uh, Tactical Soap, which I normally have over my shoulder. There's a link pinned in the description. It's uh, handmade pheromone soap. Pheromone infused soap. Give you a little bit of advantage on the suction marketplace. Uh, better than that crap that disrupts your endocrine system you're buying at the Costco in bulk. Continue uh, to support the work on the channel. Check out with coupon code Cooper. You'll get 10% off. Um, Sean, next broadcast I can do, I'm back in town on the 11th. So we're going to skip next week on the 5th. Uh, I'm back on time on the 11th. So I'm going to aim to do the 12th with you. Are you free on the 12th? You bet. Um, I might have to postpone it. So follow me on social media if you're not already. Probably Twitter is the best place to get the announcement, but I'll also post it in the um, community tab of YouTube. Uh, I'm told that YouTube is moving to a new model where they're no longer doing live events with multiple guests on it. Uh, so I'm going to have to figure out something with Streamlabs, and I'm literally going to have uh, less than a day to figure it out. But uh, we're going to we're going to schedule the next one for that date if that works uh for you sean we just yes it does right so it's yeah. august 12th so closing thoughts on control freaks before we wrap up the show and end it closing thoughts on control freaks don't let them into your life <laughs> yeah i mean guys uh you know they always say that women are the gatekeepers of sex and men are the gatekeepers to relationships so this is kind of why we're doing this to uh, you know help help guys vet for potential problems like this and also those that come on and share their experiences uh, I think that those are invaluable too. If you can learn from the experiences of others and the bad choices other people make, you can certainly avoid them yourselves. Um, so with that being said, I want to thank you guys for uh, watching. Sorry, Sean, did you want to say something there? Uh, yeah, just a quick little thought. There was a study that came out in 2013 by this lady named Elizabeth Bates in the UK, and she was uh, talking about how when women attack, and they tend to attack men when they're in vulnerable spots, like in the shower, in bed, driving. That's where you know, that's the kind of situation that this last guy described. And that doesn't start on day one. That starts through a series of escalations. And that's why you, you want to weed this stuff out quickly. Yeah. It doesn't happen on day 365 either. It's, it certainly yeah. happens early on. 
Um, guys, give the broadcast a thumbs up, and it doesn't cost you anything to share these. Um, we need to let YouTube know that this sort of content's valuable, and men need to see it. So if you could kindly uh, you know, take the link and share it somewhere after the broadcast is over, helps us out a ton. We'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Next broadcast, again, is August the 12th. We'll see you guys later. Peace.